Well, again, good morning. Christ is risen. Yeah, amen. Well, hey, it's so glad to be with you this morning and open up God's word and celebrate. Uh, actually, every other Sunday that we gather points to this Sunday. This is the arch and the capstone of Christianity. The Apostle Paul says, if what we are gathered here today to remember and, and to celebrate and put our faith in, if that isn't true, you're the biggest fools on the planet right now. You're wasting your time. You should just go out, eat, drink, and be merry because your faith is futile, is what Paul says. But our faith is not futile because the resurrection is true. And so we, we want to celebrate that this morning. So if you're new, welcome. If, you've, if you're a member here, we're glad you're here. If you're visiting family, we're glad you're here. If you're uh, just just visiting for the first time, or, or you came in off the street, or you're, you're like, I go to church on Christmas and Easter. Hey, we get it. We're glad you're here. We, we meet every Sunday, but if that's the Sundays you come, it's great. When I, when I was growing up, I was growing up uh, going to Catholic church, and so we were like Christmas and Easter. That was our jam, and, and sometimes once or twice in between. But as a little kid, Christmas and Easter in the Catholic church, man, it was packed. It was always, we never got there early enough. It was standing room only outside of the sanctuary, and, and I just remember like eight-year-old midnight mass. That's kind of a, a kind of torture for a little kid, uh, and so I, I don't really know that I learned anything about Jesus. I, I just knew uh, Santa Claus was coming the next morning, and this is the penalty that I had to pay for that. I don't know what that meant. I would find this uh, piece of tile and roll up like a cat and try to sleep there uh, just to get through that. But uh, Easter wasn't much better. Again, packed, not in the sanctuary. Uh, first time I ever fainted uh, as a human being. I was uh, about, you know, up to people, less than people's shoulders. And we were just packed in there. And I was like, man, I, this is not good. And so I began to walk uh, out. And there was this, this long, long flight of stairs, concrete stairs. And as I took my step, I passed out. And thankfully, someone was watching me and they caught me and then carried me down. Uh, but, so that's what I think about when, when, I, when I was a little kid. And I was like, well, you know, at the end of this, there's a giant uh, nightmare inducing bunny uh, that, get, that does eggs and chocolate. So it's all good. If this is what I have to do, I got to put on my green blazer. Uh, you know, that's, that's what I was thinking. And uh, sometimes our traditions around this hol- these holidays kind of obscure rather than reveal the truth. You ever notice that? It's not just an American thing either. When we were missionaries in the Czech Republic, man, let me tell you. <laughs> so so they, they don't do Santa Claus, they do uh, St. Mikolaj. And uh, I was talking to my daughters about this this week. Mikolaj comes on, uh, on December 5th, but he comes, you know, our Santa Claus is who's naughty, who's nice. No, he comes with a book of sins. So Mikolaj comes with his book of sins. Apparently he's the judge. And he comes with a book of sins, not just with the book of sins. He comes with some angels, Angeli, and uh, Chirti, demons. And so he's got angels and demons demons with him. And uh, if you've done well, then you know, the angels are going to bless you and give you some chocolate, some, some gifts. But if you've done bad, man, the charity are going to carry you away. And, and so uh, in, in my kid's school, even though it was very, one of the most atheist schools in the, the atheist countries in the world, they, they still observe this. And so the older kids, which uh, my daughter Zoe was in the older group, uh, they, they get to, they have to dress up. And so uh, you know, the, the, the tallest kid becomes St. Nicholas, and uh, the, uh, some girls get to be angels, and everyone else gets to be demons. And they, they, they go through the hallways to the uh, little kids' rooms, and the kids with kind of excitement and trepidation wait for Mikolash to come in. And they have to sing a song, and then the angels bless them. But the, the demons are like circling. And, and if, if any kid isn't quite right on the poem or the song, they drag that kid out of the classroom, down to the basement, put him in a closet it and lock it. I'm not joking. Like this is, this is what they would do. And so I'm like, yeah, well, that, that's awesome. Easter was worse. You're like, how is it worse? Well, Easter was all about the whipping willow. You ever hear about this? So, so what, what you do there is, uh, it is more, nothing to do with Christianity, but it happened to be celebrated at Easter and more of the pagan fertility goddess. And so uh, the willow tree was seen as a kind of a fertility thing. And so what the boys are expected to do is go cut down branches and weave these whips out of these branches and, and then go kind of like our trick or treat to the door, ring the doorbell. And, and the girls, the, the young girls are supposed to answer the door. And then when they see a boy with the whip in his hand, they're supposed to run out and the boy Boy runs and whips the girls, and, and in whipping them, they get fertility. That's what you want for your 12-year-old, right? Fertility. 
on Easter. And, and as, a, as a thank you, as a thank you for whipping me, the girls are then expected to get out their bag and give the boys chocolate. There you go. That, that, I can't make this up. Like that's, that was Easter in the Czech Republic. And again, you're like, wow, that really, really misses the point, right? But, but even, even so, I, I think uh, what we gather today and, you know, in our world, you, you might say, hey, Jesus rose from the dead. And you might get some reactions. Some might be hostile, like, no, uh, dead people don't come back to life. Uh, we, we know that's, uh, we just know that scientifically, uh, that they might push back. Uh, um, and actually, that's not a, that's not a terrible reaction. The, the Bible would invite people to examine the evidence, to, to consider the truth. The, the Bible does that. And even in our scene today, we're going to see people that are wrestling with this. They didn't expect this. And so the Bible invites investigation. But in our world, our postmodern world, I, I think the bigger problem is it's more like, whatever, who cares? I'll just put that in the category of the Easter Bunny and Santa Claus, and you guys can do your thing. I don't even want to spend any time thinking about it. That, that's kind of maybe the, the, the bulk of our world. But even in the church, I think uh, sometimes we do more to obscure rather than reveal. Like, think, we think about like the cross on Friday night. We think, oh man, that, that, that's, that's important. That's where, where my sins were forgiven so that someday... Hopefully a long, long time from now, when I die, I get to go to heaven. I, that's the kind of sum total of my Christianity. Uh, Jesus died on the cross, paid for my sins, and, and it's kind of Christ, resurrection, Easter. That's kind of a nice little bonus, I guess. I'm not really sure why, uh, but, but it seems like a good thing. Well, let me ask you this. Does a resurrection change anything about how you live or how you think? Because the resurrection changed everything about how the disciples, how Mary, how the first Christians in the first four centuries, it changed everything. And so as far as it is possible, by the grace of God and the help of God, I want to be as clear as possible that the resurrection changes everything. And I want to uh, bring that to bear on your life to say, it's not just that someday when you die, you get the magical ticket to go to some place called heaven, but that today, today, the resurrection and its power and its meaning is meant to invade and permeate our lives and change everything. This changes everything. So if you have your Bible, we'll go uh, two ways here. We're, we're going to go on the ground level uh, through the eyes of the first people, the very first person to see the resurrected Lord uh, in John chapter 20. Uh, but before you're getting there, to even to make sense of why the resurrection is so important, we want to zoom out and go to a kind of 30,000 foot view of the resurrection. And it has to find itself in the, the grand narrative of God's story. And so this book is 66 books written by over 40 different human authors by the power of God, the Spirit of God, over three different languages, three different continents, 1,500 years. And it's telling one ultimate story. And it's quickly like this. There's creation. We looked at that last week. God created the world and it was good. There was the fall. Our first parents and everyone else, including ourselves, have turned our back on God's kind good rule and have sinned. And with that sin, brokenness, suffering, death has entered into the world. And that's the, the world that we've been in. But, but God had a plan even from there to do redemption, creation, fall, redemption. And so he gathered and called out his people, Israel, and he made promise after promise after promise. And he sent prophets and he wooed them and he delivered them and he saved them all pointing to a grand uh, day when they would be saved. And so on Friday night, we saw that chapter of redemption find its fulfillment when Jesus on the cross paid it all. He became sin who knew no sin that we might become the righteousness of God. And with the resurrection, the next chapter, the final chapter, begins to unfold. Creation, fall, redemption, and uh, cre creation, fall, redemption, and renewal, or uh, consummation, or uh, recreation, you might say. It began on that first Sunday of resurrection. And in that moment, it changed everything. It, it, the, the chapter's certainly not complete, but it begun uh, that first Sunday. And, and the disciples, when they came and, and wake up to this reality, they say, everything changes. This is all the promises of God for the thousands of years to the people of God is now being fulfilled in the resurrection and in us by the Spirit of God living His life through us. We are part of God's reimagining the world, renewing the world. We get to play a part of that. So the resurrection means everything. 
And again, every Sunday that we gather is pointing to this Sunday because the resurrection changes everything. So let's look together at John chapter 20, just through the eyes of now on the ground level of those that first encountered Jesus. John chapter 20, I should listen carefully. This is God's word. It says, now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So if you know John and, and his gospel, he's always talking to us on multiple levels. So on the one level, he, he's talking, hey, this is what happened. He says, Mary Magdalene, remember her? Uh, she was someone that Jesus had cast out seven demons from her life. That, that, just, that, that means beyond the demons that her life was a, a life of brokenness, of, of abuse, of, of sin and being sinned against. She was a, a broken woman. And, and sometime before this, within the last three years, Jesus had encountered her, had set her free from that oppression, and she had become a follower of Jesus. And her whole world had changed, and she was all in on Jesus, and she was loving Jesus. So you can imagine three days before just how her world got Got turned upside down again. How crushed she was. She, she wasn't like the disciples who were hiding away in the upper room, cowering as fears. She was there. She saw her Lord being crucified. She saw him crying out from the cross. She heard him say, it is finished. <clears throat> she saw the Roman soldiers come and take a, a spear and jab it through his side into his heart. And she saw the blood and the water flow down the spear. She was there. She must have been crying a river of tears over the last couple days. <clears throat> but because she had a view, good view of Jesus and a good view of creation, she wanted to honor even the body of Jesus. So she saw Joseph of Arimathea and, <clears throat> man, I need some water. Can you hook me up, Ryan? Thank you. Thank you. Just throw it at me. Uh, yeah, thank you. Hey, thank you. I got it, Ryan. Man, that's service. <laughs> I thank you so much. <clears throat> okay, so she saw Joseph of Arimathea. She saw Nicodemus take down his body. She saw them take 75 pounds of very expensive aloes and ointments and all those things and, and wrap the vo- body. She saw him take him away to his tomb. She saw the stone being rolled over the face. And she is just now, uh, it just her world is broken, but she wants to honor the body. There's, there's one more ritual with the body that needs to be done. And she says, I'm going to do it. So she gets up early and, and she's making her way while it's still dark. So, so that's the one level that John is talking at. But John is also talking at a very different level. Notice what he says on the first day. He, he wants you to think, hey, what happens on the first day? If you were here last week, you know. He, he wants you to think of Genesis chapter one in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. He wants you to think of John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything that was made, made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. So she comes on the first day of the week in darkness, in chaos, and that's when God does his best work the first day of the week. And and so as she goes, she sees uh, that that the stone has been rolled away and she, her immediate thought is not, hey, this is just what Jesus said would happen. In fact, it was nobody's immediate thought. Nobody expected to see nobody. Like it's it's historical snobbery to think, oh, back then they just believed, you know, old wives tales. No, she, even though Jesus had on repeat told the disciples and his followers, I'm going to die, I'm going to be buried, on the third day I'm going to raise again, it, it just never came into their mind. It was so outside of their uh, expectations. She saw the stone rolled away and she thought, oh no, they've come to take, grave robbers have come uh, to take the very expensive aloes and ointments and, and, and all that and the, the grave cloths and they've done a, a, an ultimate dishonor to my Lord. And so she is she is broken even further. She didn't think she could get lower, but she got lower. And she, it says she ran. Now, for, a first, for, for anyone in the Middle East to run like that, that's a great disgrace. But she doesn't care at this point. Verse 2, so she ran, went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. 
She, she's just, again, broken. They hear this, verse 3. So Peter went out with the other disciple. Now we know uh, from the upper room and, and elsewhere in the context of John's gospel, when he says the other disciple or the disciple he loved, he's actually talking about himself. It's kind of like a humble brag. I don't want to put myself in here, but I am the disciple Jesus loved. And they're like, yes, John, he loved all of us. Yeah, but I'm just going to put that in there. Um, so that's, that's who he's talking about. So the story continues. The other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running. Now, for a woman to run, that's one thing. But for grown men to run, that's the ultimate disgrace. But they don't care at this moment. That They just want to get to the tomb. And so they're running together. And then I love this because it just shows the Bible has a sense of humor. Look what John says. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I mean, do you think he had to get clearance from the Holy Spirit on that one? Hey, can I put this in here so that forever forever everyone knows that I'm faster. Like John had to have brothers, right? Like I, I'm better. I'm faster. In fact, three times he's going to mention the one that got there first did this. Okay. So he outran Peter. He was younger. Uh, and, and so he gets there. We don't know how far they had to run, but he gets there first in verse five and stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but did not go in. And so He's trying to make sense of this, but it's not making sense. Then Simon Peter came following him because he was behind him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by himself. Now, again, this gets obscured in the translation. We see the word saw several times, but there's actually different words that are being used here. Mary saw, just the common word, blepo. She saw that there was no, that the tomb was open. John comes in and he sees. But now they, they don't just saw, they, they, the, second, the word they use is thereo. They are now theorizing. They're trying to make sense of this. They're like, how is this possible? If, if the stone is rolled away, but, but there, is, there is the grave cloth, that's what would have been va- valuable, not the body. And not, not just that, it says... Um, he saw the, the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth, but folded up and placed by itself. It was Jesus made his bed. And so they're like, this, this doesn't make any sense. The, the, there's the, the, the cloth that would have been around the body. Some commentators say it would have been shaped like a, a locust shell. You know, and when a locust come out, comes out, it just kind of leaves the shell. That, that would have been there. But then the head cloth has been carefully taken up and it's been folded and set aside. John wants you to think of another scene. He wants you to think of John chapter 11. When Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, his friend, after four days, and called Lazarus out, he came out, but he was still wrapped in everything, and Jesus said, hey, somebody help him out. That, that was an extrinsic power, and, and Lazarus got a, a temporary reprieve from death in that moment, but he was still bound. And what, what John wants us to see, something's going on. There, there is an intrinsic power. It is the power of God doing this, and he is he has risen. And so as they're theorizing, verse 8, the other disciple, that's John, who had reached the tomb first, in case you forgot, also went in and he saw. Now the word is oida. That means he perceived, he connected the dots, he put the puzzle together. It, it is he believed. He becomes the first believer of the gospel. Now he hasn't seen the resurrected Lord, but something clicks in that. This is the work of God. Now, all the implications and all that it means to, that the resurrected, resurrection has happened, certainly not fully, but, but enough for him to believe. And in John's gospel, to believe is to receive eternal life. And to have eternal life is to know, see, and savor God, to be re- back in right relationship with God. And so in that moment, something eternal, something transformational happens in the heart of John. It says, for as of yet, they did not understand the scripture that, must, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Meanwhile, Mary has made her way back. She, she is, uh, we see it. She's weeping. She's, she's crying again. It says, but Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. She's, she's trying to make sense of it again. She's, she's weeping. There's, you know, she, her, her shoulders are, are shaking. She's sucking her lower lip. She's got the snot and the tears. And, and she's just, just a mess because her world is totally destroyed. 
And we know this because check out the next verse. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. Now, every other time in Scripture, when an angel shows up, man, that rocks the house. There, there is fear and there is terror because a, a heavenly be being is here. You'd be tempted to worship. You would, we would all get in our, on our face right now if two angels showed up on the stage right now. And that the service would be over. That that would, it would just, but she is such, su such a state, so broken, so mourning that she's like, whatever, angels. Like she can't even connect the dots. Maybe God is doing something here if there's angels. She's that kind of broken right now. Again, she's not, she's not trying to do some wish fulfillment. She is not expecting anything in this moment. And so the angels, they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? They're confused. In Luke's gospel, they say to her, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. Like, like, they're confused. We remember from 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12, it says the angels long to look into this thing of redemption. They're, they're, they're confused because uh, they're, they're not made in God's image. And so even though a, a third of them also had a fall, they don't ever get rescue. They don't ever get redemption. But they wonder and they ponder at the work of God for, for millennia. Like, God, what are you doing with these rebels, with these enemies, with these people that continue to turn their back on you? Why do you continue? Continue to pursue them with your love. And so they're watching. And like us, they watched in horror on Friday as, as God, the Son, has taken on flesh and he is dying for their sins. And they're like, what is going on? What is going on? And, and they see Jesus give up his spirit. And, and they too are like, this doesn't make any sense. But now it's Easter Sunday morning. Now they know that Jesus has rose from the grave. And they, they just, that they are, uh, no doubt, there is a celebration going on in heaven heaven, right? They're, they're like, right? Oh, you thought they were American angels. No. And they're like, there's a party going on in heaven. Why are you crying? Like, well, no, I didn't think that's what it would be like. Well, I don't know. I mean, I'm guessing maybe they got a soundtrack going on and every now and again they'll, they'll pull out something maybe a little bit different here. And the angels are just singing this. All right. But as they're, as they're rolling in heaven, and, and they, they peel back heaven, and the angels show up, and they're the, the people that should be the most explosively joyful people on the planet right now don't get it. They, they, they haven't believed. They, they, they didn't connect the dots when Jesus said, I'm coming back, I'm coming back, I'm conquering death in the grave. They don't get it. And they say, why are you weeping? And so she answers them. She says, she said, then if, she said to them, they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Oh, she saw, but she didn't see. Again, if she was expecting Jesus, she would expect an emaciated, bloodied, battered, barely living kind of man standing before her. But, but this man she sees, she doesn't know who it is. She does not yet have eyes to see. Though she sees, she doesn't see. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? It's the same question that the angels asked. Why are you weeping? And then he asked this question to her, but also to every one of us in this room today and everyone who has ever lived. Whom are you seeking? What are you looking for? What are you pursuing with your life that you think is going to satisfy your soul? Because we're all on a pursuit, right? We're all trying to fill the vacuum of our heart, uh, maybe with different things. And he says, who are you seeking? It says, Augustine said, Lord, you have made us for yourself and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. Supposing him to be the gardener, 
She said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and and I will take him away, supposing him to be the gardener. This is what N.T. Wright, one of the best New Testament scholars in the world, especially on the resurrection, says. She makes the right kind of mistake. She mistakes him for the gardener. Remember last week? Who's the original gardener? God is the original gardener. Who does he put in the garden? The first Adam to work it and and take care of it. But he fails. And now now God, the gardener, is in the garden again. The second Adam is in the garden again. So she makes the right kind of mistake. He is recreating. He is cultivating the world anew again. She just doesn't quite see it yet until her eyes and her heart is open. Verse 16. Jesus said to her, Mary... Mary. John wants us to think of John chapter 10. Just says, I am the good shepherd. My sheep know my voice, and I call them each by name. So he is calling your name this morning. Michael, Andy, Bob, John, Stephen, Carrie, Julie. He is calling your name. He knows your name. And when she hears her name, her world changes again. This is a roller coaster for her. She turned, and we don't know how, how much ground she had to cover in that moment, but when she sees the re- resurrected Lord, she runs and she embraces him with all of her might. And she says, Rabboni, which means teacher. She, she just, with all of her strength, is hugging his neck. She's like, you are dead. You are alive now. And she's just clinging like, I'm never going to let you go. I'm never going to let you go again. And, and I think with a smile on his face and joy in his voice, he says to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. He said, it, it's, it, I, I'm back, y'all, but, but I, I need to go ascend. And he, in, in John's gospel, he says, it, it is good for you that I'm leaving because when I ascend to the Father, I'm going to send my spirit to you to fill your life with all the purpose and the meaning and the mission that you were made for. And so this resurrected Savior, with laughter in his voice, tells her, gives her the first great commission. He says, but Go. Go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Go tell them the gospel. And the gospel is this. I have conquered death and the grave. I'm going up to my God, and now he's your God. My father, and now he's your father. Because he has made enemies, sons and daughters. He has opened up the doorway to the family of God once again. And Mary, I want you to go. I want you to go with this news. I want to give you this commission. So the first person to ever see the resurrected Lord is a woman. First person to ever go preach the gospel is a woman. Look what she does. Mary went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. I, I, she went with joy. I imagine she ran once again. <laughs> this time, uh, again, I, I imagine she ran with tears in her eyes. But this time, tears of joy. And, and she goes and she preaches the gospel. The word announced, that's kind of conservative. She preaches the gospel. I have seen the Lord. He is risen. He is alive. And, and you know what? She doesn't even care about their response. We, we know their response. They don't really believe her. But that wasn't what, what, what the issue was. She had so been transformed by the resurrection that call to go was not a burden. It was a blessing. You you mean, Lord, now with your resurrected life, now that you are bringing about redemption and reconciliation and renewal in the world, I I get to join my life, my little tiny story with with your global cosmic renewal purposes? Oh, I'll do that, Lord. That's a joy. Yes, Lord, send me. And so she goes. And that's true of everyone that has come and seen and heard Jesus call your name. He also sends you out on a mission. It's not a mission that's a burden. It's not a mission that's like, oh man, I guess I got to tell someone about Jesus. It's a mission of joy. It's a mission of love. It's a mission of purpose. It's what you were created for. It's what the world needs. It is the good news. It is what absolutely will transform the disciples. They'll go from these cowering uh, little uh, fearful men in a locked room to encountering the resurrected Lord, to becoming these bold lions for the faith, to go to the ends of the world earth, to lay down their lives with joy, to make known the name of Jesus as far as it is possible for them. 
And then the first four centuries, in the first four centuries, this, this would spread. Because you know what? There are a lot of things in our world that are contagious, not just pandemics. Now, there are other things. Fear is contagious. And the disciples had been sharing in that. Anger is contagious. Greed is contagious. Lust is contagious. Violence is contagious. But there's other things that are contagious. Hope and joy are contagious. That's why we want to be around people that are full of hope and joy. Because when you're around those kind of people, your hope, your joy begins to rise. And because of the resurrection, the resurrection above all absolutely was contagious. Because they said, there is hope, there is joy. I'll give everything to have that kind of life. And they would share that with their neighbor. And they'd share that with the next person. And this meant that they got to join in God's cosmic renewal project. Not someday when you die do you get to go to heaven. But today... You get to be a part of what God is doing for eternity. That's why Martin Luther said, hey, if I knew the Lord was coming back tomorrow, what I would do today, I would plant a tree. Like, what? That seems kind of weird. It's because you have a Gnostic, you've adopted a Gnostic, Platonic view of spirituality in our world. The spiritual is good, physical is bad, God's going to burn it all, so let's not even worry about the environment, let's not worry about oppression, let's just get to heaven. That's not the view of the Bible. The view of the Bible is that tree that Martin Luther is going to plant, I don't know what it's going to look like, but when God comes and restores heaven and earth, that tree is going to be glorious. That tree. That is why the the first four centuries, the the followers understood, hey, when we go into the city and we help out the broken and oppressed, that's going to have eternal outcome. When we, when we serve widows and orphans, that's going to be part of God's renewal project now. When we give our lives to the people that are dying of the plague in the cities, and some of us die too, it doesn't matter because when we sow those seeds, they're going to they're grow into something glorious. They understood it was because of the resurrection. Jesus, his vindication that all the promises of God, of renewal of the cosmos are coming true in Jesus. This is why it matters. This is why it's not just about when you die. It matters today. And so the creation matters. And there's some really good things about that because Jesus rose from the dead. We, we don't have to have the creation be an idol for us anymore. We can enjoy it. So go out and N.T. Wright says this. He says, hey, we spend 40, a lot of traditions spend 40 days before Easter in Lent. And it's this time of kind of like our, our confession of sin. It's, it's a time of just recognize. It's, it's a somber time. He said, but then we spend one day, one day celebrating the greatest news that the world has ever heard. That's insanity. We should at the least have an eight-day festival where we have champagne for breakfast every day and, and we gather every day and then we do a 40-day time where we just say, because of the resurrection, we're, we're going to explore new things. We're going to uh, give, give our lives away in new ways because the resurrection has changed everything. We're going to celebrate. So celebrate. Gather your friends And go to a restaurant that's outside your tax bracket and eat a slow meal, eat your steak, drink your wine or your Coke or whatever your deal is and celebrate because Jesus is going to redeem it all, is redeeming it all through you and through me. Hope is contagious. That's why we want to be people of hope. We should be the most explosively hopeful, joyful people on the planet today. We should take that to our neighbors we should take that to our city. We should take it to the broken, wherever we see brokenness, poor, poverty, oppression in this world. We should give our lives to that because it matters to God because of the resurrection. And to that end, let me pray for us. So, Father, thank you for your word to us this morning. Thank you for the resurrection hope. Lord, you have filled our lives with meaning. They were meaningless apart from you and apart from your grace, but with you, our lives have eternal meaning, not just later, but today. So help us, Lord, to live in light of the resurrection. Help us to show us what that means uh, in our families, in our neighborhoods, in this city, and in this world. To the end that you are glorified and we are satisfied, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.